Hello, I'm Karen Golden Orante with Living Histories here at Cohasset Historical Society. And today I am with Ross Sherbrooke, a lifelong resident of Cohasset, who's here to tell us some awesome, remarkable stories about his memories of Cohasset growing up. Good morning, Ross. How are you? Fine. That's good. Great to be with you, Karen. This is good fun. Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's been very interesting to listen to your stories as well as research the, the, into more uh, depth of the stories that you've told me. So you, work, you came here in 1935 Correct. with your parents. Right. And could you tell us a little bit what brought you here and where you lived? Well, I don't know what brought me here. My parents brought me here and they had local friends. They had been living in, in Brookline. Um, and um, we moved into the little house at the corner of Brook Road and Elm Street that was owned by Mrs. Fred Pratt, who lived up the hill toward the Cove in the Federalist House. And um, that house is still there. It's a very old house uh, across the street from the Savings Bank, and then diagonally across the street were the Jasons, and a little further toward the village um, was Fleming's hardware and gift shop. Um, and uh, as a little boy of three or four years old, um, uh, Billy McAuliffe was one of my first friends. His, his father was a mechanic at Mr. Reddy's garage, which was down Brook Road behind the savings bank. And he and I would go down there and harass Joe Sylvia and um, Manuel Marx Mr. McAuliffe was um, always very quiet and kept to his work. Um, and then um, Lindsey Durant um, and Jody Benson and Hopi Warren, who lived back up the hill right here, just um, two houses away from the Historical Society, were young friends too, because our parents were, all, were pals. And Lindsey Durant and I used to fight in the playpen from the age of practically nothing. <laughs> so. So what are your earliest, we have some wonderful photographs that we're going to show as well, um, with your being pulled by a horse and a sleigh with, um, by Mr. Jason. And- No, it's Mr. St. John. Oh, Mr. St. John. Yeah. And mm -hmm. some of the other neighborhood children. So what, when your father was here, where did he work when he was, or where did he have to commute to to go to work? He didn't um, have to commute very far. He had been working for the A&P because he had lost his job um, during the Depression. And, um, and so he worked at the A&P. And then he uh, got a job in Boston because he was an MIT engineer and a refrigeration expert, so-called. And so he commuted to Boston and went to work for the Quincy Market Coal Storage and Warehouse Company. So one of the things we found out about the AMP is that it was, in 1930, the largest retailer in the world, which was, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> which was pretty spe spectacular because it had like 20,000 stores yeah. worldwide, which I thought that and one I remember of them my was, father saying- One of them was right downtown Cohasset. Yes. Right? Right Across beside- Across the street from, from uh, St. Stephen's Church and the, what was then the jail. Yes. Um, and- um, um, I remember my father saying they only paid him $22 a week. <laughs> it may have been a huge company, yeah. but they knew how to make money in those days, I guess. So now your grandfather, however, was living in, still living in Brookline at this time? No, no. He, he died in 1917. Okay. And uh, he had a pretty remarkable story with his um, career, business. carriage business. Yeah. Um, of course, long before I was born. Mm -hmm. But um, the Chauncey Thomas Company, which he was a partner in, uh, I, I gather, um, was a pretty good carriage builder. Well, for 40 years, uh, yeah. we were talking about that it was at the base of Beacon Hill there right. on Chestnut Street. Yeah. Um, and then it had the four alarm fire, which was pretty spectacular, but no one was injured no, and then they and, moved. And it, and it was quite, it was right next to the fire station, but the place was so full of paints and varnishes and shellacs and stuff that I'm sure that all burned very well. Right. Um, my grandfather in um, before, in the late 90s, 
um, had been recognized for some carriage designs. And we have a couple of medals that he won at the Paris Exposition of 1890, I guess. And he worked for the Studebaker brothers in the 90s and then came back to Boston, I would say probably about 1900. But my father was actually born in South Bend, Indiana at Studebaker. Oh, interesting. Hmm. So um, the, the refrigeration company that mm -hmm. your dad worked for, and was that the one that was re related to Mr. Bird's Eye? Uh, Mr. Bird's Eye uh, worked up some with my father, and they were, of course, interested in the same thing. Mr. Bird's Eye had, had become fascinated with the idea of freezing food from his experience in Newfoundland, yeah. <laughs> which I read about. Uh, um, and one thing led to another, and so they perfected that kind of thing. And then um, I'm, uh, I don't think father had anything to do with Mr. Bird's Eye during the war, but he was very much involved with um, supplying the convoys leaving Boston for Europe and England. And developed, he, my father developed the process for freezing milk in World War II, um, among other things. But so he was interested in that kind of thing. Um, I don't think Mr. Bird's Eye had anything to do with that. Yeah, because I, I had no idea Bird's, Mr. Bird's Eye was, had started his freezing food business in Gloucester, yeah. which I thought was fascinating. Well, but of course, that ended up being general, I mean... Uh, um, became, eventually became General Foods. Right. Quincy Market Coal Storage had big refrigerated warehouses in Gloucester, primarily for fish. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm sure that they got together there, um, and there was a huge warehouse uh, on T Wharf in Boston. T Wharf's now been taken down next to Long Wharf. Uh, and I can remember being in a coal storage room one time with my little brother, and there were seven million pounds of cranberries in it. Um, and we threw cranberries at each other. <laughs> <laughs> what we remember. So yep. those, so now you're become school age. Well, let me ask you some of the other earlier memories you were talking about. Of, <laughs> of growing up in Cohasset, particularly you were close to town, so you had an opportunity to be very close to the harbor. Um, and at what point in time did you pick up sailing, which was a big part of your life? Oh, much later. I mean, um, before the war, oh. I was just a little kid. I remember the hurricane of 38, um, and we talked about it earlier, but I remember Hadley south of, with a big apron on his back bringing a, a big chunk of ice for our ice box. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the furnace was coal furnace. Had to be, the ashes had to be shaken down. And the ash cans we'd take up to the dump in, um, in Beechwood. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the Williams brothers, Dell and Frank and uh, I can't remember the other, the three Williams brothers, they came and developed a little business. They had a truck and so they hauled garbage and stuff. But, um, but in 1939, after the 38 hurricane, um, my father bought the house on Jerusalem Road, 278 Jerusalem Road, and, and we moved out there. Louis Salvador moved us, Litchfields Express. So, and that's when, you, was that when you fir first got your family car, your first family car? At we that had point? the family car before we moved. Yeah. <coughs> The 1928 Nash, the 1928 Nash had curtains in the back with little acorn tassels on the bottom and you could pull the thing down. It had a mahogany steering wheel that I could stick my feet through. Uh -huh. It was quite a, quite a car. Yeah. My father paid 10 bucks for it and oh. made a lot of noise and at the end of the war he sold it for 50 bucks. Uh -huh. And goodness, who knows how much it would be today. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so now you've moved over to Jerusalem Road, yep. and um, but you were now. At which point in time did you go to the Ripley Road School? Nineteen forty. Okay, so you went to Miss McMahon's kindergarten. Okay, and she lived where Saint, the new Saint Anthony's Saint Anthony's is, <coughs> in a great big Federalist type house. <clears throat> God, excuse my voice. Um, and she was wonderful teacher, we all had a wonderful time. And that's where I met all my classmates, you know. 
Um, Lindsey Duran, of course, was a classmate. Billy McAuliffe, Stevie Wigmore, Harold Litchfield, Peter Lagell, um, all the guys who ended up running the town later on. Yeah. Uh, Anna Simeon, who's a fixture now, Apres Apresaison, um, and you know various other people. Um, Betty Hearn, Dutchie Hearn's younger sister, uh, um, a, a, a lot more. And there must be a list of that class someplace. Mm. So now the home that you, your dad bought on Jerusalem Road was originally, was prior owned by the Hanlons? Yes. And a lot of people don't know who the Hanlon brothers were, but they were a fixture in Cohasset and kept many people busy with work, with jobs, yeah. particularly during the summer months. Um, the the Hanlons were originally from England, and they were a clown pantomime act, world renowned, and it was really very interesting because there's a lot of information about the Hanlons that we have certainly found, and certainly books have been written about them, yeah. as well as you have you have a, uh, a photograph of the Hanlons well, brothers. Well, these are the, the the later Hanlons. Yeah. Um, this uh, this photograph is of Will and Edward Hanlon um, in the barn at 278 Jerusalem Road. There is a board with Hanlon Superba written on it, or there was at least when we lived there. And um, these are the last two Hanlons to perform in the circus, as far as I know. Father wrote the circus a letter, and Ed and, or, or Fred wrote a letter back, and then when the circus came to Boston, they invited uh, my parents and my little brother to go to the circus, which they did in the 50s, um, 1950s, several times. And they all had a great time together. And one of the funny things that, um, that uh, um, uh, Fred Hanlon wrote, he was just a comedian, he, in, the, in a letter to my parents, he said, we had a wonderful time visiting with you and thank you for the Mitch mince pies, which we enjoyed drinking so much. <laughs> well, the Hanlons are, have been attributed to certainly other acts they, yeah. as well. But that was much earlier. Yeah. When they came to Cohasset, what, in the 1880s? Um, well, they came to America in the, in, in the late 1880s. But okay. we have, let's see, we had them till 1905, I think. I know William Hannon is actually, I think it was this, that William Hannon that's buried at Central Cemetery. Yeah. So anyway, they were a fixture here A couple in of town. generations, yeah. yeah. And, and many people in town worked at the, there was a three-story building right. that is obviously since torn down that all of the... the, uh, the they had trapezes and um, the stages. all kinds of high wire acts and things going on. And they had trapezes in the barn at 278 Jerusalem Road as well. Wow. Um, but the but the the fancy acts were perfected um, at the three story building in town, down by the down by what we called the depot. Oh, the depot. Okay. Well, it's still called Depot Court, right? Oh, the that, road. This is true. This is true. <laughs> right. Um, so now some of the other characters and some of the other um, experiences that you had uh, uh, growing up. You spoke about um, Mr. Jason, and you also spoke about um, bread and cheese, mm -hmm. and you also spoke about the, during the Prohibition era. Could you just highlight some of your boyhood memories on those? Well, Mr. Jason, Sergeant Jake Jason, was very much a fixture in town and was um, very much around during Prohibition, um, so that when um, the fishermen um, brought in a load of booze. Um, very often, um, people like Sergeant Jason would be there to greet them when they came ashore. And I'm sure that not all that booze was confiscated and um, destroyed by the police. Because before we moved to 278, when we lived at the corner of Elm Street and, and Brook Road, on a Sunday afternoon, I can recall um, my father hearing this call from across the street, Roscoe! And my father would go across the street and they would get out of Jake's basement and crack open a good bottle of scotch or something that 
that Jake had uh, taken in probably as a, a small bribe for <laughs> um, letting the booze go through. Um, I remember a story that uh, Louis Figueredo had a dory full of um, cases of whiskey that he was rowing in from a schooner offshore that had come from um, Nova Scotia. And, um, um, and the revenue cutter was chasing him. And Louis just kept rowing calmly in because he knew exactly where he was. And as he rowed, um, rode in, he rowed over a ledge and the revenue cutter went aground on the ledge. <laughs> and he got in with no problem. Uh, I wasn't there, obviously, for that, but I remember the story. And then both he and um, both Louis and um, Bill Poland um, uh, pasted labels on the, on the booze that came in at Black Rock Beach and found its way up to the bread and cheese on Forest Avenue. The bread and cheese was a famous speakeasy. And whereabouts on Forest Avenue was that? Um, well, obviously, it's up over the hill and just starting down the first downhill okay. on the right-hand side going inland. And it's back away from the road. Okay. It's still there. You mean the building that was... It, the building yeah. is still there, yeah. So The private home. So you went to the Ripley Road School. Yes. And, um, and then you went on to... Went to Ripley Road School um, all during the war. And um, in the second grade, Miss Rohde, our teacher, left in the middle of the school year to join the Marines. Um, and then um, after I got through the sixth grade, I went to Milton Academy in 1947. Um, and um, I, I had uh, a wonderful time there. Um, I, had, um, I had pneumonia one year and ended up having to repeat a year. So I graduated from Milton in 1954. And that was, it was a terrific experience going there. Made a lot of difference. So. And after you, now you commuted to Milton at that yes, time? Yes, for most of the last two years I was able to board. Yeah. And that made all the difference in my grades. Yeah. But prior to that, commuting um, began in the dark in the middle of winter um, at the railroad station where my father was going to the train and I would get picked up by a man who worked at um, the Nor Norwood Airport. And he would deliver the Durant brothers and Kai Sylvester and Benji Williams and me to Milton in the morning and then pick us up in the evening on the way home. Hmm. Um, and that was exhausting. And I would get home, have supper, and fall asleep at my desk and not do my homework, which had something to do with it <laughs> as well. <laughs> So now when you graduated Milton, then, then where did you? I went to Princeton. Okay. Um, in New Jersey, because most of my classmates went to Harvard. In those days, it wasn't so hard to get in. In fact, they took people because they needed people. There weren't a mm -hmm. lot of kids from the Depression. And a few went to Yale, and even fewer, five of us, I think, went to Princeton. One guy went to MIT. Um, but I needed to meet some new people and get away, so all my best friends went to Harvard. So is that where you, when did you fall in love with sailing? Is that? Oh, gosh, gosh long before that. Okay. Um, Lindsay, who was really my oldest living friend now, longest living friend, um, and I started sailing at the Coasset Yacht Club yeah, when we were about eight years old. And we had rookies, which was seven and a half foot cat boats. And I could get you a picture of one if you want. Um, and uh, in those days, during the, it was during the war, 1942-ish, um, 43, uh, we just went sailing. Um, and we raced five days a week when the tide was high over the flats. The rest of the time, we just fooled around the yacht club and sailed a lot, had a wonderful time. And, um, and so uh, we got a lot of time on the water and, and I became fascinated with the water. The, the, the steward at the yacht club was a wonderful guy, Martin Grassi. Um, uh, he lived in North Situate, up beyond the Lincoln Gristmill. And um, he let me follow him around. Basically, I learned to splice and this, that, and the other thing. 
And, um, and I learned um, about sailing in the fog and other things that have held me in good stead over the years. So if you'll have, uh, what I'm trying to, you built a sailboat at some point in time during your... At the, at the shipyard. I've never built a sailboat for myself. Okay. So you were building sail, sailboats at the shipyard? The, originally, I was working on uh, minesweepers, 165-foot AMS-class minesweepers for the Navy. <coughs> but then I was put on um, the construction of a 89-foot schooner that was being built for Mr. Plum of Plum Tools. Um, and I worked with six guys from Nova Scotia who really knew how to build ships, wooden ships. And it was a terrific uh, schooling for me. Uh, I'd always had tools. Many of my tools come from my grandfather who had them in his carriage factory. Um, and so I, I'd had a tool bench. My father built me a tool bench when I was for my fourth Christmas. So I've always been around tools and I like tools and like to work with my hands. So that was a great experience. Um, and I, while I was out of Princeton, I was also asked to um, sail in five and a half meter boats, um, uh, looking up, uh, preparing for the trials for the Olympics. And I did that in the spring, and I, it was too bad. I had to go to Bermuda to do that in the spring. Uh -huh. <laughs> we raced a lot. Um, and then um, I came back, and I was um, more interested in getting through college, and so I went to Harvard Summer School. And in the fall, um, went back to Princeton and uh, talked with the dean, and he said that um, if I got my military out of the way, there would be no question, as long as, quote, I kept my nose clean, unquote, unquote they would take me back. And um, so I thought, gee, I'd have to wait till the middle of the winter to go back so maybe I just get my military out of the way. So I joined the Navy and went to the boot camp in Maryland and um, um, was accepted to go to submarine school in New London. But my mother had run into the mother of a guy named Peter Willauer, who I'd sailed against um, in the junior sailing championships when I was racing with Lindsay. And he had just been sent to the Naval Academy to teach sailing. I was really excited about going into submarines, and they changed my orders, and I spent my naval career teaching sailing to the midshipmen at the Naval Academy, and also try, you know, sailing in various championships. The Navy liked to get their name in the paper, so I was in the World Star Championships and two or three other regattas in the Bermuda race, and so forth. So now, after that, you went back to Princeton. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I went back to Princeton, and I knew that I had to um, find um, some subjects that I could enjoy that nobody knew anything about so I could get by and graduate. So I uh, majored in um, European civilization as it translated to South America. and. Um, I had to repeat the sophomore year, so that next summer I went to the University of Guanajuato in Mexico and studied. Lived with a wonderful family who had five daughters, and that certainly made my understanding of Spanish improve a lot quicker. And I had a wonderful time at the university and learned a lot, and toured around Mexico with my contemporaries who were local Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to Princeton, and. Um, Things went well, and so my, the summer before my senior year, I put in for a study grant to go to Brazil um, and do research, and, but it didn't come through. So I went in a transatlantic race to Sweden, um, and when I got to Sweden, it turned out I got the study grant, and the best thing about that was that I went from Sweden to Lisbon and spent a week doing background work in Lisbon, um, and my Portuguese was terrific. Having learned to swear in Portuguese as a little kid with the Figueiredo kids and others in this town, before I knew what it meant in English, 
I perfected it in college. Mm -hmm. And in, in Lisbon, my Portuguese was terrific. Then I flew to Brazil in a, in a propeller plane, because that's all there were in those days, pretty much. And when I arrived in Rio de Janeiro, I thought I was on another planet. It took me a week to understand the Rio, the Cajoca accent, and get along in Rio. And um, I was very lucky, and in the course of the week, uh, I, I met a guy who knew a guy who put me with a family to live with um, that was headed by an architect who had been deposed as the Dean of the School of Architecture of the University of Brazil for his criticism of Brasilia. So he pretty much wrote my thesis yeah. for me. He was wonderful and he put me in touch with a lot of people. Um, and I traveled around Brazil um, and had a, a wonderful summer, most notably um, a Polish friend of mine from Princeton whose family had emigrated to Brazil. Um, and I uh, drove a Jeep from uh, Rio de Janeiro to Salvador da Bahia. It's about 700 miles, no roads outside of beyond, much beyond Rio. All cart tracks and jungle and so forth. And um, that's really the only time I've ever carried a sidearm. Um, and of course, we never used it. Everybody was nicer than the last because communication was so unusual in the interior of Brazil, all they had was double sideband, old-fashioned radios that were interfered with by um, um, thunderstorms, and the thunderstorms were prevalent. Um, so there wasn't much communication, and so wherever we went, people took us in. They wanted to know what was going on in the outside world, and it was a phenomenal trip. Great adventure. At Princeton wrote the thesis, and they okay. let me, they gave me a good, very good grade, got a very high honest grade, and I graduated. Awesome. <laughs> and then I came back to Boston and one thing led to another and they said that you, I couldn't get a job in the financial business because I didn't have a business school degree. And then I ran into this funny little firm called Fidelity. Um, and there were only 32 people in the company. And they said, well, we've got to have a trainee sometime. So um, what did the First National Bank offer you as a trainee? And I said, $5,000. And they said, well, you can come to work here. And that's where I worked. That's the only job I've ever had where I could wear a coat and tie to work. So when I very first, we, when I very first met you, you asked me, do you know wh what the Humane Society is? And I'm thinking, sure, they take care of animals. They're located on 3A in Situate. Yeah. And you said, no, that's not what the Humane Society is at least what it started off as. And we were talking about, you know, and then I went gung-ho on trying to find everything about the Humane Society that I could in our short period of time after meeting. But it actually started in 1785 as a group of, uh, wanting, a group of people that wanted to ensure that vessels right. that crashed offshore um, were saved. A, a, blind, a blind doctor. Um, came from England and met with half a dozen merchants of Boston at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern in Boston. And they got chatting about one thing and another. And this doctor said that about 12 years earlier, the Royal Humane Society had been formed in England in order to save lives of shipwrecked um, sailors. Um, and so these gentlemen of Boston were losing ships etc. And the coast is really rough. So <coughs> they formed the Humane, the Humane Society of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is a real mouthful. Um, and they started out with um, having uh, uh, beach walkers on the outer beaches of Cape Cod, Radio Beach, Nauset, um, etc. Um, and, and these guys would start from different points, meet, exchange tokens, and come back. Um, and they would always be having their eyes out to sea to see if there were any ships that were blowing ashore and so forth. And then they built some little houses of refuge that they stocked with firewood and, uh, and, and, and some food. 
Um, and from that, um, th they decided that uh, they ought to do more in Massachusetts Bay as well. And so the first lifeboat in America was in Cohasset in 1807. Prior to that, there's a letter in the, in the file um, commending um, this first of all life-saving institutions in America for its good work. And it's signed by a guy named G. Washington, who happened to be the first president, yeah. 1793, uh, etc. So it grew from there. Um, and the first lifeboat was um, um, stored behind Whitehead but it became so difficult to get out the channel in a bad nor'easter that they moved it to Pleasant Beach. Um, and that's where they eventually built Boathouse 23 um, that operated until the beginning of World War II. And the Humane Society and um, then later uh, the U.S. Life Saving Service and finally the Coast Guard were formed. And they, I don't know that they really competed but they were serving some of the same areas. And of course, the most famous part of, of the Humane Society um, is um, the lifeboat station at Hull, where, um, where, <clears throat> where Joshua James um, uh, was the uh, coxswain of the boat and in charge of, of the boat station, which is now a museum um, uh, in Nantasket on the way out to, to uh, Point Allen, and, and it looks over toward Boston Light, made a tremendous number of rescues. He saved over 500 people and um, became very famous. And then later on, his son, Tecumseh uh, James, uh, took over. And by that time, the Coast Guard was becoming more active. So I don't know whether it really competed or how it went. Well, it was interesting because in the, in the process of reviewing it, on the United States Coast Guard.gov website, it says the first life saving, the life HUD uh, built was in Cohasset, Massachusetts. They spelled Cohasset wrong, but you could figure yeah, out right. two T's. <laughs> but I thought, wow, that's pretty, co you know, here we are, right in a, the, the Coast Guard the, website. The Coast Guard has, um, has, um, not just befriended, but really wants to be considered part of the Humane Society in many ways. There's a brand new extreme cutter. I think it's 400 feet long. And last summer or the summer before, I guess, summer, maybe it was fifth, summer of 15, um, they, that cutter was commissioned in Boston and called the Joshua James. Oh. So they have really, really done all I can to become part of the Humane Society. Mm. So you have a photograph of where the original, the original <coughs> uh, hut that was built on, <coughs> uh, at Whitehead. Um, I don't have the, a hut at Whitehead. I'm not aware that, that there was one, but there may have been one. And, but but this is Pleasant Beach, Pleasant Beach here, Pleasant Beach all here. And the, um, the Humane Society boathouse is hard to see, but it's right there and it has a little white sign on it. The boathouse next to it was Dr. Sears' boathouse, and then Luce's boathouse, which eventually became part of our family, is there. The railings in the wall um, b next to Luce's boathouse could be removed so that when the wagon came down the road, they could launch the um, lifeboat in, uh, here. And this is pretty well protected by sea ledge and black ledge, which are just offshore, not in the picture. So it was easier to launch um, there. And, and Dr. Sears' boat, Gunrock, is, or is hauled up there where the rails would be if, the, if the, his boat wasn't there, his power boat. So for some people who don't know where Pleasant Beach is. Pleasant Beach, if you go on Atlantic Avenue, past Sandy Beach, headed toward Hull. Pleasant Beach is the next beach. And those houses, boat houses were <coughs> along the causeway and just at the end of the causeway. Um, and um, they're all gone now, but the, 
Boathouse 23, the Humane Society Boathouse, which was just big enough to house the boat and the oars and so forth, was moved in 1940 when the Humane Society went out of business, uh, or 41, when the, Humane, when the Coast Guard took over everything. Um, and it was um, taken down to Situate, where it's at Young's Boatyard, and now houses the town junior sailing program. Mm -hmm. When the, when the, um, the um, lifesavers were on alert, they stayed at Luce's Boathouse, because um, that became more of a gunning camp um, than a boathouse. The, it originally had boats in it, but Mr. Luce Sr., who who, among other things, was the first regent of Harvard College, was a, a clubby type of man. And so they decided to put the boats underneath the boathouse, because the boathouse is on stilts, um, and, and um, make the, the uh, inside of the boathouse more fun and more habitable. And that's the way it is today. Um, the boathouse, because it's on stilts, uh, um, was the only structure on Pleasant Beach to survive the Portland Gale of 1898. Mm -hmm. And um, it had to be fixed up, but um, uh, there was a couple of fishermen's camps right next to it and they were all wrecked. There was a hotel and a general store across the street, they were all wrecked. They, weren't, they didn't fall down, but they were declared you know, that nobody could use them anymore. Yeah. So I, everybody wants to know anything more about the, the original Humane Society. They have some photographs at the Irish Mossing Museum in Situate right. and the Driftway, which is only open Sundays from 1 to 4. So it's a very t tight window to be able to run over there and check out some of the photographs. Um, anyway, it has been just a really very fascinating to have the opportunity to, to talk with you Thank you. I have learned so much, so many things that I've had an opportunity to do more and more research. So one I, more thing. Certainly, yes. The Irish Mossing Museum in Situate is a great thing oh. to take in, um, and it, um, I've been there several times. And one of the times that that I was there, the trustees of the Humane Society all came, and uh, awarded a silver medal to two guys from Situate who um, rescued a fishing boat that caught, res rescued two of the three crew of a fishing boat that caught fire off Situate on its way back in. And um, uh, the third kid was caught down below and didn't make it. But the other uh, two guys were picked up by two fishermen who um, broke ice got in their dinghy, went out to their fishing boat, gunned it out of the harbor, and picked these two guys up out of the water as the fishing boat was going down. Mm -hmm. um, and so we awarded them um, um, silver medals for life saving and um, a stipend. I think it was probably $5,000. Um, and needless to say, uh, they were thrilled. I'm not sure what they did with the money, but they really loved the medals. <laughs> And that's what the Humane Society does mostly now. Um, in order to qualify for a medal um, and a stipend, you have to have put your own life uh, in jeopardy um, and um, rescued a Massachusetts citizen or be a Massachusetts citizen who is the rescuer. Uh, it's only for Massachusetts folks one way or another. Uh -huh. And I could go on and on about that. Well, again, it's been really fascinating. I can dig up those names uh, if you want to. Okay. Uh, and we do want to show the one boat of the life that we were talking about, this lifeboat. Yep. Um, from the, but it's, again, you know, they do have their life jackets on, but they sure have their hats yeah. on. Uh, Frank Salvador uh, was the captain um, of the lifeboat, and this is a 1918 picture, April 2nd, 1918, and there are a number of copies around. Frank Salvador was, um, was the captain uh, Ellsworth, um, who ran Ellsworth's boatyard, 
um, was the first um, in line next to the Frank, the steersman there. Next person was um, uh, Joe Antone, um, who, among other things, ran the crossing for the train down here, just beyond where Butman's place is now, when it was, when the, when the, when when, before no. the road was cut off for the new train. Yeah. He'd get out there and stand up with a stop sign. Uh, and he also, Mr. Antone was also a very good wood carver and made a number of little boats, little wooden boats that Mary Fleming often sold. Um, Antone Figueredo, known as Toady Figueredo, was a lobsterman who probably um, hit a mine because he knew where the lobsters were in World War II and he was out fishing. And when I was coming home on the school bus, there was a column of smoke going straight up. He probably pulled up a mine with his lobster traps or somehow or other um, um, got blown up. Um, but he certainly knew where the lobsters were because nobody else was out fishing there. Um, and he never was seen again. Frank Martin, I didn't know. Alfred Mapes, uh, I knew his daughter. She was really attractive and much older than me. Abe Antone, um, who is um, the, the present Abe, Abe Antone's father. Um, um, uh, Frank Jason, who drove my school bus, one of the green school buses green we school had buses, in those days. Yes. And uh, Manuel Salvador, whom I didn't know, and of course Joe Sylvia, who I knew well. Joe Sylvia had, had a Model A Ford coupe, and he had a bushel basket between the radiator and the front bumper. And he would put his lobsters in the bushel basket and deliver them. And his dock was right next to Mill River Marine. Um, and that's where I would go with my father when we wanted to have a lobster. We'd get out and get a couple of lobsters from Joe. Um, and he paid for his children with lobsters to Dr. Howe, according to my information. So that's about does it, doesn't it? Awesome. That's very good. Every, everyone there from Cohasset. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, so again, thank you very, You're very welcome. much for your time. It's really been a pleasure. You're um, welcome. And it's very important, I think, to be able to capture the history of Cohasset that a lot of people don't know anything about. Um, and it just adds it's, to their now knowing a little bit more. Yes, and it's much more fun to talk about my memories of Cohasset than it is to talk about me, and I really don't care whether you have things like my Milton and Princeton stuff in there yeah. or not, but, um, or, or business even. But um, I've had a lot of fun. Awesome. Um, and we're still going. Great. So. Well, thank you very much for watching Living Histories. Goodbye.